Hello, listeners. As you no doubt are well aware, the economy has taken a significant hit as a result of lockdowns related to the coronavirus pandemic we're undergoing, and nonprofits like CatholicCulture.org are no different. We've certainly been struggling more than usual to make ends meet, but thank God our generous boosters have enabled us to run a special Easter Challenge grant in which any of your gifts up to $31,000 will be matched. And thanks to your generosity, we just have about $4,000 left to go to meet this grant completely. That said, we're also coming close to the end of our window here. The deadline is Pentecost, May 31st. So now's the time for us to max that thing out so we can keep going. Now, I know many of you are struggling economically just as we are, but if you're among those who can afford to help and you value the work we do at Catholic Culture, not only our podcasts, but our news, our commentary, our liturgical calendar resources, our vast store of church documents and great Catholic articles, please consider helping out. Again, we just have a little over 4,000 to uh, go, so we've almost made this thing, and for that I'm really thankful to all who have already given. All donations to Catholic Culture are tax-deductible. We pray for all of our donors, and not just the donors, but all of our readers and listeners daily. And in fact, even if you can't give anything, please offer us your prayers. And if you yourself have been suffering either physically or financially from the pandemic, please email us at witness at catholicculture.org so we can add you to our prayer list. So to help us out, go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Thanks so much and God bless you. Oh, and while you're at it, check out our new podcast, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, in which James Majewski and I explore the Vatican film list. You can hear our first couple of episodes at catholicculture.org slash criteria. Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas V. Miras. This podcast is an offering to the Holy Family and, less importantly, a production of CatholicCulture.org. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm here today with Richard DeClue. Richard is the creator of YouTube videos on theology at a channel called DeClue's Views, and he's a doctoral candidate at the Catholic University of America in theology. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Something you've been focusing on in your YouTube channel is a number of different theologians associated with what's called the Nouvelle Theology And we're here today to talk about that, some of these individual theologians, but also kind of the concept of the Nouvelle Theology in general and the degree of validity that it has, the misleading perceptions that it's given rise to in in thinking of all of these theologians as part of kind of a unified group or a trend moving in the same direction at the very least. So perhaps we can start with the context of this discussion and the reason it interested me what you're doing over there is I've been getting the impression that in certain circles, I mean, I I suppose basically in traditionalist circles, there's a tendency to kind of look for a scapegoat for Mm. problems in the church in the past several decades, especially since Vatican II. And of course, there, there are a number of different scapegoats that are used, but in the sort of purely, let's say in the purely intellectual realm, Often, the blame is put on thinkers like Henri de Lubac or von Balthasar. Mm-hmm. Even you know, some people would accuse Ratzinger of being a modernist now. And <laughs> yes, now, now some people have, I would say, incorrect reasons for thinking that. But a lot of people have gotten this impression on the basis of maybe just watching one Taylor Marshall video or reading an article on 1 Peter 5 or whatever. And and so now, now they've yeah. come away with the impression that, you know, de Lubac is, is at the root of what's wrong with theology today or, you know, right. I remember I did an episode on the Jacques Maritain's contributions to the philosophy of art and 
I got an email from someone mm-hmm. saying, oh, I, I watched this EWTN documentary on Saul Alinsky and it mentioned that, you know, Maritan and Alinsky were good friends. And so, you know, Maritan must be really bad and dangerous. And so, you know, I understand right. that that might Go give people association. Right. I understand that that might yeah. give, give people pause. I mean, it certainly bothers me, but, yeah. but mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. But I think it's a real shame if that's the one sort of data point that people have. Right. So what do you think is behind? I mean, I, I gave my, my sense of what's behind this. What, what do you think is behind this? Not historically, because we'll get into that, but in contemporary right. terms, this kind of popular level animus against some of these thinkers? Well, I mean, other than misunderstandings and misrepresentations, I think, I mean, I I do acknowledge at the heart of it are are real concerns that people have. In many ways, I think the traditional reaction against some of these thinkers or what they think are some of these thinkers is rooted in real problems in the church and in the liturgy and in the culture in general. So I think in some sense, there's a sense in which the church has given too much up to the world. It has acquiesced to bad philosophies, have led to terrible theologies, heresy sometimes, not infrequently being preached in certain places, being taught at schools of theology, liturgies that are anything less than (laughs) sacred. And so as a reaction, there's a tendency to say, okay, let's just do over. Just like when you were kids and might play a, you know, a game with your friends and you messed up. So, well, you know, proclaim do over. It doesn't count. Let's just start over. Let's go back before our perception of when the problem started and see if we can't just regain what was lost. And in that sense, I completely understand, and I actually, you know, can relate to that. The danger can be that in doing so, you're not necessarily reading the history exactly accurately in some cases. And certain people end up becoming the enemy that may have actually been allies all along and you didn't realize it. So, I mean, to hearken back to someone like Cardinal Newman, right, when he said to no history is to cease to be Protestant is to no history is to become Catholic. There's a certain sense in which you, you kind of have to really understand the history and the actual thought of these people before you can make an accurate assessment. And I think for many people, there just hasn't been an interest. It's more of, well, I heard from someone that these guys were the ones to blame. Ergo, they're the enemy. And I'm just going to go back and read who people I trust and what they tell me to read. And it's understandable. There's another aspect to this too, which is the kind of the popular level of a lot of this. I mean, you're a theologian. I'm someone who is not, you know, I take somewhat of an interest in these things. But, you know, a lot of people, it's hard to kind of don't want to be sort of elitist and condescending, but a lot of people would probably be just as well off in their lives never having heard of De Lubac or Gargou Lagrange or Cajetan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, most people aren't supposed to be intellectuals. Right. And then there's obviously a place for kind of like educated lay people who take a general mm-hmm. interest in things but aren't specialists. And, and that's sort of, I guess, what my podcast is speaking to. But, you know, it, there's something, it kind of works both ways in that, you know, if it doesn't matter if somebody had ever heard of Delubach in the first place, I don't know how much harm it actually does if some layperson who doesn't actually read theology thinks Delubach is bad, you know, <laughs> based on mm-hmm. having watched a, a video or something. But it, maybe it's more of a symptom of an overall problem of uh, kind of like, like as you said, looking looking to return to some golden age in the past or something like that. Yeah, I would I would say that it's important in one sense. If they never heard of them, that'd be one thing. If they had heard erroneous things about them, that's another. So, you know, yes, if an average lay person is just faithful to the magisterium and trusts the magisterium and, and just tries to be a good Catholic in so far as they, they know it and you know receives the sacraments regularly and prays devoutly every day, I would agree with that. I think in some sense, part of the issue is now the fact that 
they have been blamed for what some traditionalists see as erroneous doctrine coming from the magisterium. So that's now where it becomes important to defend these folks to the degree possible, because they're basically, if you didn't have lay people being told, don't trust documents of the magisterium because they're heretical, then then that point would be well taken. But the reality of it is they are being told, do not trust magisterial text because these people are the ones because it's it. infected by this right. nouvelle theology right okay i see yeah that, that makes sense and that's why i think it ends up being important right now that makes sense because it's it's less of a historical question right because if you know if somebody had a bad impression of de lubach but the position they held was the correct position mm-hmm. you know and you know, nobody was actually being hurt in a sense because de Lubach has already passed on and this right. this will all be sorted out in heaven. You know, that would be one thing. But if it's being used to kind of reject legitimate truths or legitimate nuanced statements mm-hmm. of the truth or things like that, right? that's a problem. So you are kind of in these, you know, I don't know if you call yourself a traditionalist, but you're kind of familiar with those circles mm-hmm. and probably more conversant with them than I am. You're a regular attender of the Latin Mass, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. So your mission, a lot of it seems, with this channel, seems to be to speak to those circles and kind of bring about a more objective, less sort of sensationalistic, politicized dialogue on some of these theological issues. Right. And I think a big part of my goal is actually to just be an advocate for accuracy. I've said repeatedly in a lot of my videos that I'm okay with someone disagreeing with certain aspects of their theology as long as they're actually presenting it accurately before they knock it. So I'm just allergic to straw men arguments. I don't like it. It bothers me because it's dis it's dishonest. It tends towards arrogance and when I've spent a lot of time studying people and then I hear people saying, oh, well, so-and-so says this and it's not accurate, <laughs> it bothers me because I feel like I need to – I've always somewhat – I'm a small guy. I'm not very big. I'm like five foot six or seven, but I've always had little man's disease you know, from of mice and men <laughs> and would always stand up to bigger bullies and things, and especially if they were attacking smaller people. So not even necessarily myself, but if, if I saw someone being picked on, I just sort of rush to their defense. It's just my nature. And so if I see someone being maligned inaccurately, I just I feel sort of a need to step in and say, wait, as a matter of a justice, let's at least get them right. And then if you want to discuss whether they're good or bad on this point, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to have that discussion, right. but let's get it right first. And and you certainly haven't set yourself up as a defender of the Nouvelle Theology. I mean, that would, you know, you've you've come to different conclusions in, as regards to different issues that you've discussed in different videos. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with some of their stuff. I disagree with others. I agree with a lot of part of that, what is labeled as Nouvelle Theology, but I don't swallow it wholesale. I, you know, I'm, I like to look at individual arguments and presentations precisely that individually. I don't necessarily think that I have to agree with all or nothing of of a certain thinker's thought. I say, oh, well, this is actually a really good point, but here's where it goes astray. So I try to take a nuanced view of people. I don't expect that it's either all or nothing. So what we'd like to do, I guess, here is in this episode is to just kind of clear the air, get rid of some of the misconceptions about this group of individuals maybe touch on some of the issues, at least with the individuals that we think are worth you know, discussing and mm-hmm. whose thought is worth preserving to some extent. So let's dive in. What is the historical context in which these new approaches to theology emerged? Well, I mean, you have to go back a couple centuries. First, of course, you had the modernist crisis, and that basically centered around some new ways of thinking that arose out of the Enlightenment. And you had the development of what we would now call the hard sciences, and then an attempt to apply the scientific method to non-hard sciences like history and literary interpretation. 
and those sorts of things. So that ended up making its way into theology as well, where you end up having modern science start changing the way people thought about how you understand the Bible and how you're supposed to read it critically. And then also the, you know, the liberal Protestants of like the 1800s, for instance, that began to demythologize the scriptures and, and try to say, oh, well, we don't have to take that seriously. That's just obviously a literary genre. We don't take it literally. And so that, that led to all sorts of problems calling into question the historical validity of the gospels, of the Old and New Testament testimonies alike, questioning of miracles and those sorts of things. And basically started to make Christianity just one means of expressing human truth in a vague sense among others and started to relativize Christianity as just an aspect of anthropology. And then you had to turn to the person where it was all about the the subject. And so that had some ties as well to the French Revolution, which is very anti-ecclesial and anti-clerical, as well as you know, associated with humanism, a sense of let's just celebrate what's human qua human and not so much what divides us. And it became very popular amongst French and British intellectuals. And ironically, one of the people associated with modernism shares the last name, well, at least part of his last name with Gergou Lagrange, who we'll talk about later. But there was a Marie-Joseph Lagrange was a critical exegete who started to really rethink how we understand the Bible in problematic ways. And then Alfred Loisy. And there's a whole host of other people behind modernism. We don't need to go into that too deeply. But of course, you end up having this basically reducing Christianity to just a humanistic ethic. And that became a problem. And so this started getting into Catholic theology as well, bringing this modern philosophies and ways and worldviews into into Catholic academies. And so there was a reaction against that, an appropriate one, because it, you know there was a lot of heresies being developed in that regard. And that led to the development of what's called neo-scholasticism, which developed so much in the late 19th and up to the mid 20th centuries. And it was basically a reaction against modernism and modern philosophy like Descartes, Kant, Hegel, people like that. And it was an attempt to revive and develop from the medieval scholastic tradition. Now, in some sense, it had never completely gone away. In the Dominican order, since Aquinas, you pretty much had a running commentary on Aquinas through the likes of Cajetan and Suarez throughout the centuries. So it wasn't like it had ever completely gone away, but it was sort of only maintained primarily in the Dominican and in some sense, some Jesuits as well. But so in the late 19th century, this was seen as, okay, let's go back to that as a way of overcoming the errors of modernism. And in many ways, it sought clarity because there was so much going on with modernism where anything goes and you could determine thing, print anything, however you wanted that there was a desire to go back to clarity and precision and dogmatic precision. So the emphasis became on understanding revelation as a content of syllogistic truths that were perennial. They were ahistorical in the sense of they're just timeless truths. So anything that sort of tried to tie theology to history was somewhat suspect from the outset. And this sort of Clarity led to what's called the manualist tradition, where you started having textbooks called manuals of theology, where the professor would just create a textbook and sort of take you through step by step the logic of what you had to believe and why, almost through very rigorous philosophical axioms. And of course, you know, it was sort of highlighted with you had Eterni Patris of Leo XIII supporting the return to Thomistic philosophy, Christian philosophy, following the model of St. Thomas Aquinas, as well as Bonaventure, I might add, but primarily Aquinas. In 1907, you had Pascendi Dominici Gregis by Pope Pius X that condemned modernism as the synthesis of all heresies, 
And then in 1910, you had the oath against modernism. So there was this concerted effort on the part of theologians in the magisterium to weed out modernism. And that's so neoscholasticism was sort of the primary way that that was combated. And in that sense, it was definitely a good thing <laughs> to help overcome modernism. But then you had the students that were taught under the manualist tradition. So you had certain theology students going through this, including de Lubach and Ratzinger and von Balthasar and others, who just found it a little bit lifeless and cold, almost, as Ratzinger said, too self-enclosed. He got the sense that some of his professors had stopped asking questions altogether and were just sort of robotically repeating things semester after semester after semester without any real inquiry or inquisitiveness. And as someone who was interested in the truth and seeking the truth, he just he found that somewhat not fully human, that it seemed to just involve a cold logic and there wasn't much of a heart in it. And so he didn't it didn't seem to touch the whole person. Now, it could just be he had bad teachers and even admitted that because it really wasn't Thomas himself that he had a problem with. It was more of the way that Thomas was presented that just he found to be unsatisfying. And so you had certain students that they wanted to try to broaden theology a little bit and, and also to answer modern questions because if neo-scholasticism was concerned with perennial truths that had been revealed and taught and handed on, in some ways might have a difficulty dealing with questions that weren't asked before and it kind of just ignored in some ways modern philosophy rather than engaged with it and responded to it. And so if there was a good question that came up or an objection that one found difficult to answer with modern philosophy, you know, it would probably just ignore it in a sense and rather than actually directly answer it or take seriously some of the things that were being brought up. And so some of these students just found that they needed a little bit more than just a repetition of static syllogisms. What was the solution that they looked for to this problem of kind of a, maybe an over abstraction of theology? Well, to answer that question, I think we kind of have to ask what is nouvelle theologie? What is new theology? Because it's a term that I don't particularly care for myself because I find it to be somewhat misleading. It actually originally was coined by someone named Pietro Parente in 1942, but it was really popularized by an article in Angelicum Journal by Reginald Gergou Lagrange, who was sort of like the preeminent neo-scholastic, neo-Thomistic scholar of, of the day, and a great theologian. I mean, there's no question. So he wrote an article. He was a French Dominican, and he wrote an article. The English translation is rendered as, where is the new theology leading us? The original French, I think, might have more of a connotation of where is it going? You know, Nouvelle Theologie, where are you going? Like, what's the end game here? And it was sort of a call to basically a call to arms in a sense of, you know, this is leading us astray. It's taking us away from Aquinas. It's calling into question perennial truths of the faith and seeing dogmas as reformable and or, you know, is so historically conditioned that we don't necessarily know what they meant and what they mean now is not actually what they meant then. And so he saw a lot of dangers in Nouvelle Theologie and, and worked against it. And that's where that term came from, Nouvelle Theologie. So it was really created by the detractors of people. And then people were sort of just set, told that they were a part of the group, whether they thought they were or not. So de Lubac famously had retorted that he goes, what are you talking about? My theology is not new. Their theology is new. And his point was that he thought by going back to the sources of the church fathers and even Aquinas himself, that neo, meaning new, new scholasticism was what was new. And he was trying to go back to the more, the depths and breadth of Catholic tradition. So he didn't see himself as a new theologian at all. I mean, he, he very explicitly said he's not really concerned. He says there are certain theologians in his day that were concerned with modernizing and becoming familiar with modern philosophy and modern ways of thinking. And he explicitly said that that's not his concern. His concern was actually more of, are people aware enough of Catholic tradition 
going back to the early church councils and fathers through the scholastics themselves, such as Aquinas, and not just repeating what they heard through commentators on Aquinas in manuals. So as far as where they looked for solutions, it depends on which version of Novel Theologie you're talking about, because there really were different camps within it. You had the more conservative side, which I refer to primarily as the Communio school. And Communio was a journal founded by Henri de Lubac and von Balthasar and Joseph Ratzinger when they broke away from the more liberal side, Concilium, the journal Concilium. All this took place in the 70s after Vatican II. And so there was, even at the council, so even before those journals existed, there wasn't really like the Neotomist white hats and then the Nouvelle Theologie black hats at the council. It was a lot more than just two. You know, in America, I think we're used to thinking Republicans and Democrats. And so everything's like in diodes in a way and or dipoles. And that's too simplistic. You had like the Henri de Lubac side, which was more ressourcement, which is a French term that means return to the sources, such as the church fathers and the scholastics and scripture itself and really delving into, he wanted to reinvigorate, for instance, reading sacred scripture through the four senses that was developed in the high scholastic period, the four senses of scripture. That was one of his main concerns. And then you also had those that were more aggiornamento, which is an Italian word that means updating, bringing up to the day. And so they were more interested in modernizing in that sense of, oh, how do we make it relevant? And, you know, oh, we can cast aside things that are just, you know, no longer relevant to our day. And we're much more open to new ideas that might not to a more traditional Catholic seem compatible with the faith. They didn't really seem to be as concerned with maintaining a continuity across tradition and were more open to- So who would be some thinkers in that group? Uh, Definitely Hans Kuhn, who ironically was involved in bringing Ratzinger to Tumingen when he ended up teaching there. And then they (laughs) very quickly butted heads. I would also mention Schillebeeks. He was one of the definitely more aggiornamento guys and updating And you could say both of those guys are downright heretical, and I would have no problem or qualms saying that. Now, I haven't studied their thought in depth, but I've I've looked into it enough to know, yeah, I mean, they were censured for a reason. I mean, Hans Kuhn, under when Ratzinger was the head of the CDF, revoked Hans Kuhn's right to teach as a Catholic theologian because it was so bad. You might say Chenu, Congar is sometimes associated with that. He might have been a little bit more between the two schools. I mean, it's more of a spectrum, I think, than even aggiornamento and ressourcement is a little bit simplistic. So it's more of a spectrum. So how Congar is probably somewhere in between the two camps, depending on the issue. Rahner is somewhat of an outlier. I just did a video on him today. He's kind of tough to pin down. He was part of the Concilium group. But what's ironic to me is I think he was probably the most neo-scholastic and neo-thomistic of all of them. So it's kind of difficult to pin him down on one side or the other. I, th- he, I think he's actually more towards the right than the left, even though he associated with people on the left more. Him and Ratzinger collaborated a little bit and then kind of had a falling out where Ratzinger famously said that they, as they worked more closely together, he became more and more clear that they lived on two completely different theological planets. Although he said they, they very often wanted the same things, but for completely different reasons. So their goals were often aligned, but their way of getting there was completely different. So Rahner's a little bit harder to pin down. In general, he wasn't really, he was open to the modern world in a sense of, okay, let's take their thoughts seriously, but you know, let's try to rein it back in and make it orthodox. So he was concerned with orthodoxy. Rahner was not really open to just throwing out the tradition and doing whatever you want, like most people would consider a a true liberal to be. But he did, I think, leave himself open to criticism in in some ways by trying too much to give people a benefit of a doubt when he probably should have said, no, that's just wrong. So he's a little bit harder. I think Skielbix and Kung are are two of the most obvious on the heretical aggiornamento side. And then on the more ressourcement side, obviously the Communio school of, you know, 
Delubach sort of being the leader and then von Balthasar and Ratzinger kind of being his protégés, if you will. So you've done videos on kind of the most famous controversial issues to do with Delubach and, and Balthazar, respectively. Right. So with mm-hmm. Delubach be the nature and grace controversy, yes. with Balthazar it would be, you know, dare we dare hope we that all men yeah. be saved. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a bit about Delubach then. Mm-hmm. First of all, just to sort of like clear the air, you know, some people will say, well, Delubach's thought was condemned by, well, I forget which pope, but in the encyclical, Kimani Generis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that exaggerated? Because he's not named, so you know people can say that you know that's his position. Yeah. But you can always argue that well, that's not really the position that he holds, and it doesn't right. mention him by name anyway. Mm-hmm. So, so what's the deal with that? First of all, it's kind of an interesting <laughs> historical conundrum when you really delve into it, because he read *Humane Generis* and the parts that supposedly pertain to him, and he was like what are you talking about? Like, he's actually practically repeating what I said verbatim. So he actually felt that Humani Generis backed him up huh. and didn't understand why people were saying he was the one that was criticized. And what happened was other people started saying, oh, that's against the Lubach. And it sort of caught fire so much so that his Jesuit superiors were worried that Rome was going to do something if they didn't. So. It's interesting because he was never condemned at all. Rome never censured him. They never questioned him. His own superiors didn't. They simply said, we're not going to have you teach. And so for about nine years or so, he didn't teach. Now, I think at the time he hadn't been teaching anyway, but they basically just made it clear that he was not allowed to teach and they were sort of watching what he was writing very closely. Right. I think Gargu Lagrange tried to come after him with the Holy Office, right? Yeah, it didn't get very far, but yeah, I think he did. He didn't like the Lubach. But no, he was never censured. As a matter of fact, when it was all sort of over, the whole the nine-year period, his Jesuit superiors approached Rome and said, is it okay for him to return to teaching? And the response they got back was, there's nothing in his file that suggests that he shouldn't be teaching meaning there was never prohibition for him to teach in the first place. and There was nothing to suggest that he shouldn't. So, and as a further historical note, it's interesting is that, again, I forget, like you, I think it was Pope Pius XII that wrote Humani Generis. I that could sounds be wrong. right. I think that's right. It was 1950, but he had actually been encouraged by that same Pope and was told that he thought that his work could prove fruitful for the church. And then, you know, during the time that he was not allowed to teach theology, he wrote one of my favorite books, and actually one of his easiest books to read, because de Lubach was a scholar among scholars. I mean, his, some of his books, the footnotes get almost overwhelming. But one of my favorite books he wrote was called The Splendor of the Church. And that book was actually used by the Pope as, it was like sat on his nightstand to read it before he went to bed. And it's almost poetic. It's almost, I mean, it's a beautiful, he wrote a couple books on the church, but that one in particular, I I just absolutely loved it. You know, the splendor of the church. Is that the one you would recommend to people? Yeah, it's an easy read. It's really, I don't think controversial in any way, shape or form. And yeah, and there's actually a line in that book that I think speaks to Henri de Lubac's demeanor. There's a line in there where he says that for the true man of faith, Mere obedience will not suffice, for he will begin to love obedience itself. And if you compare the Lubach versus someone like Hans Kuhn, who basically, you know, he just circumvented the magisterium anyway. He just took a position as a Christian philosopher in the Protestant side of the Tübingen school after he was not allowed to teach Catholic theology anymore. And basically thumbed his nose with the church and never recanted what he said, you know, never recanted his rejection of papal infallibility to this day, as far as I know. And whereas de Lubach basically just humbly submitted to the fact that he wasn't going to be allowed to teach and did what he was allowed to do. And and he even wrote in that book as well, he says, look, it might very well be the case that you can be punished or ridiculed based on someone misunderstanding your position. (laughs) 
But then he says something very humble, which was, but you should not just assume that that is the case. You might actually be wrong. And so that sort of humility in the face of being sort of looked down upon by superiors, but not in a direct way. Again, he was never censured. He was never asked to recant anything. He was never presented with with anything to respond to, but he still thought, look, maybe they misunderstand you. And, you know, it's not just the way they're treating you. But he says, but maybe not. So have some humility. Right, because you don't want to be an arrogant martyr either. Like right, yeah. Obeying and thinking you're a martyr when you're actually wrong. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that speaks to, you know, his character. The one I've read by him is Paradoxes of Faith, which mm. is very accessible. I mean, it's it's in the form of short aphorisms. Right. And that's a profound book. I'm also kind of interested in a book called The Drama of Atheist Humanism, which yeah. I only know the title, but mm-hmm. it kind of intrigues me. Yeah, which actually relates a lot to his writings on nature and grace in a way. It was <laughs> this very interesting history there. I mean, it's it's ironic. I mean, one of the reasons that his work on nature and grace was done was because he was worried that – so basically, he thinks that later commentators on Aquinas got Aquinas wrong, and he thought their solutions to the question were not only not accurate with regards to the portrayal of Thomas, but were actually leading to modernism and to atheistic humanism because he thought they were giving so much freedom and autonomy to nature that matters of – religion and revelation and grace were somewhat external and extrinsic to nature to where nature didn't really need it, that it could be fulfilled in itself. And so actually his concern was that the logical conclusion of the way that some of the commentators on Aquinas was leading was precisely to a secular world. Right. So that was his concern. Unless there's anything else that you really want to touch on, I thought maybe we could just spend maybe the last 15 minutes mm-hmm. just talking about De Lubac and Nature and Grace mm-hmm. as a kind of case study in how some of these thinkers have been misunderstood or maligned on the, the traditionalist side. Would that be amenable to you? Sure. I would like to one add thing before we do, though, just so people, maybe they can start looking into it. I always find it somewhat sad when a particular thinker is known for his most notorious statement or work. And certainly in the case of Henri de Lubac, Nature and Grace has been the topic that most people associate him with. But I actually think in many ways, some of his best work was actually on Eucharistic ecclesiology and his historical study of understanding the nature of the Eucharist and of the church and how they relate together and understanding the church Eucharistically. I think that's probably his best theology is actually in the realm of ecclesiology, not theological anthropology. So it's interesting that everyone kind of latches onto the nature and grace debate. But yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. I would say I have a video on it already, but I can go over it kind of briefly. As I said, you had St. Thomas himself writing on nature and grace to a degree. But of course, you know, people coming afterwards or then also comment on it and delve into it and then give their own opinions and they start adding different parts to it. And... There was a, a thinker at, at one point, I think it was Dennis the Carthusian, who basically argued against Aquinas and stated that man could not have a natural desire for the beatific vision, because there are many points in Aquinas's writings where he says that, that there's a natural desire for the beatific vision. And Dennis thought that that was wrong, because if there's a natural desire, then God owes us grace. Because we can't attain the vision of God, supernatural beatitude, without the aid of grace. And therefore, he thought this would be unjust if God did not therefore grant it. Because if it was something that our nature desired itself, then it would be unjust for the creator of that nature to deny the the finality being reached. So he argued against that. And then... Later on, you had someone, I think it was Cajetan in this instance, basically tried to reinterpret Aquinas to make it seem as if he agreed with Dennis's position, and so developed a Thomistic understanding of nature and grace aligned with Dennis's conclusion. 
and said, well, Aquinas didn't really mean that there's a natural desire. It's just there's a velleity in nature. There's this sort of longing for it if it were possible, but we really don't know it's possible until it's revealed to us. And therefore, it's not really a natural desire. It's a desire that comes from revelation and grace being offered that now we have this new end in man. Whereas Aquinas had said that, no, there's only one end and it's a supernatural one, even though we can't attain it by nature. So the neo-Thomistic tradition sort of followed Cajetan and then Suarez and up to this day with Feingold, who's a brilliant philosopher and theologian. I mean, Feingold's a brilliant man. There's no doubt about it. But that whole school to this day wants to have more of a sharp distinction between nature and grace and say that, no, there is a natural a merely natural beatitude that man can attain through natural powers. And that's how they think they can maintain divine freedom and offering grace. And one of the sort of mental images they used to secure grace, the freedom of grace, because that, that was the concern was how does God remain free to offer grace? And their solution was, well, God could have created us, or created a world, and this is what Humana Generis is talking about, right? God could have created a world of humans, of rational animals, to whom he does not offer supernatural beatitude. And he would be justified. There's no obligation for him to do so because there's a natural beatitude, a natural end. De Lubac basically saw that as wrong in at least three levels. One, he doesn't think it's necessary. He doesn't think you need it to secure divine freedom in offering grace. Two, he doesn't think it's sufficient. He doesn't, you know, well, the fact that God could have created a different world in which he doesn't offer grace to rational animals has nothing to do with whether he's free in offering it in this world. So he doesn't think it's sufficient. It doesn't accomplish what it seeks out to do. And then finally, he thinks it's actually dubious with regards to God's freedom in offering grace in this world. Because then you're basically saying, well, in, he's only free in this world because he could have created that world. Well, how does that secure freedom in this world? Are you saying that now he must offer it to us because he offered it? And so his contention, I actually ended up writing a paper for my doctoral course on Nouvelle Theologie on this question. And I titled it Divine Freedom in the Debate Over Nature and Grace, because I kept reading different authors talk about and, and they made good points on both sides of the question. And then it finally dawned on me that, well, no one's really talking about the actual point of contention. No one's giving an argument about divine freedom, because that's really the crux of the question. What secures divine freedom? Henri de Lubac's position was, God doesn't owe us grace even now. It's always free. There's no obligation for the creator to give us even a natural end. So from his perspective, even if, you know, there was a purely natural end, he says he's not required to give it to us. Like we have a really poor understanding of divine sovereignty if we think he owes it to us. Yeah, it's more like, you know, a good, maybe you could say in accordance with his goodness, he wouldn't create someone to need something and then withhold it from them arbitrarily. Right. But that's on account of his goodness. Right. And it sees the plan as a whole rather than sort of isolating the individual steps of the plan. You know, if, if right. God's whole reason for making us is to give us, you know, unite us with him in the beatific vision, then it doesn't take away his freedom to say that he's made us with that desire. Right. If that makes sense. Right. And actually, in inciting, he doesn't only appeal to Aquinas in this regard, he also appeals to Robert Bellerman, <laughs> who basically ends up saying the same thing, that it's, it is neither new, considering we're talking about new theology, Bellerman said it is neither new nor against man's dignity, I'm paraphrasing here, that he should have a final end that he cannot attain by his own natural powers. He and others saw it as more of, as you were saying, a manifestation of divine goodness, rather than a problem of divine freedom. So that really wasn't an issue until later on, where other people were calling the divine freedom thing into question. But yeah, I mean, de Lubac's position basically is, look, God created us for himself. And as St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until it rests in him, in God. So, you know, the whole purpose of creation is 
to bring man into communion with God, right? You know, even going back to the Baltimore Catechism, right? What's the purpose of our existence, right? To come to know, love, and serve God in this world and be with him forever in the next. And Dulubach's position is, and that's it. There is no other end. There's no other reason for our existence. This is the de facto reason God created us. And there's no point in pretending that we could be completely happy without being with him in heaven and just having a natural beatitude. That's not why we were created. You've been talking about divine freedom. Mm Mm-hmm. What about the issue, and this is something I discussed in an episode, a little bit in an episode on Garagou Lagrange in Mm -hmm. the past, but what about the issue of just sort of like the desire not to confuse the two orders of nature and grace? Like one of the problems raised by Mm Garagou Lagrange is that, you know, if, if man has in his nature, so to speak, a desire for the supernatural, then that means his nature is in some way proportioned to the supernatural, if I'm remembering his article correctly and therefore we've we've done away with the distinction between nature and grace and and man is already sort of divine in his very nature right and i think it's a very interesting question i think you know de Lubach's position would be that you you kind of with aquinas you have a distinction between nature and grace i mean even believe it or not even taylor marshall had to admit this in his own video where they were talking about this there's a point where he says well de Lubach was actually kind of right Aquinas talks about a twofold end of man, not two ends of man. Oh, interesting. So he did his philosophy dissertation on this question. So even Taylor Marshall, who was bashing de Lubach throughout the episode, admitted that in a certain sense, de Lubach was right, that it's twofold, duplex beatitudo hominum. And it's actually in the name of one of the, uh, the titles to an article that de Lubach wrote on it as well, duplex beatitudo. It's a twofold end of man, not two ends of man. And there's a big difference between the two, no pun intended. So you go from Aquinas having a distinction between them, but a close link. They're not two things that are sort of welded together, almost in a sense, unnaturally. They're not like two separate destinies. Right. They're not. They're not. Two alternate paths. Right. And then later on with the commentatorial tradition, you end up having sort of a radical separation. So now you have, instead of grace, you know, with Aquinas, obviously grace perfects nature, right? It both heals it and then elevates it. With a radical separation, it's most like, well, you have this world of nature that's sort of self-enclosed and self-sufficient, has its own purpose for existing. And then to it, you can add this other realm that now sort of brings it out of itself into something separate. So there's more of a, a radical separation between the two. And I think there are dangers in that. And I think de Lubach has a good point, which is that you've now misunderstood the nature of nature. Why does nature exist? I mean, the reality of it is, in some sense, you're conceding too much to the modernists. You're conceding too much to the natural sciences. You're telling them that the world is self-sufficient, can be understood on its own terms, and you don't need an appeal to divine revelation to account for it, right? You've now just given it up. Well, we don't need revelation or supernatural or grace. The world is is sufficient unto itself. It has its own ends. That's all we need. That is atheistic humanism. And de Lubach's whole point is, you know, look, you have to understand the nature of the reality of it is the triune God we worship and come to know through revelation is the God of creation. He is the one that created, not some deist God who created, you know, this world and kind of just left it on by itself. You know, it's not just an unmoved mover that created the world. It's the triune God whom we're called to love and adore and worship. So nature itself is proceeding forth from the triune God and is called back to the triune God. And if you try to take that truth out of the equation and just speak about it as far as what we can know from pure reason or as far as natural capacity then you've lost sight of the gospel from his perspective. You, you've now given up. It's like, much. how could you decide that kind of the Aristotelian vision of God, knowable through reason right. and his relationship to creation is sort of sufficient, closed in, in its own order? Right. I mean, it, it may be valid, but that doesn't mean that there aren't essential pieces missing. 
for human happiness and from God's perspective. I mean, it may be valid so far as it goes, but that doesn't mean it's sort of complete in its own order or something like that. Yeah. And I think for me, that was really the aha moment because I really did sort of, I really gravitated towards the neo-scholastics when I first started studying all this. I was like, well, no, this makes perfect sense. You have a world of nature, you have a world of grace. And ironically enough, Rahner, again, bringing him up because he's typically seen as like the poster child for liberalism. And I still having studied him, I find that ironic. Rahner's position on nature and grace is much closer to Guerlain Lagrange and the neo Thomistic school. He does sort of push the notion of pure nature and then super added grace. And to the point where he thinks to secure divine freedom, the natural dynamism towards God that is in, in human nature, the obediential potency that he calls the foregriff, the preapprehension of absolute being in its totality, which he equates with obediential potency from the neo Thomistic language. He thinks that it secures divine freedom because it serves a natural purpose, which is it's the precondition. It's the condition of the possibility of our knowledge and love of finite things. And therefore, has an openness towards revelation, but doesn't require it to achieve its ends. So he actually does have more of a, you know, two ends in his theology of nature and grace than de Lubach did. But I think when I was reading de Lubach, I'm trying to figure this out. I didn't quite understand what the problem was. And I, I remember reading it and pouring through his different works. And at one point I was like, oh, that's what he means. And it's sort of strange because, you know, sometimes you can look at the same thing over and over again, and then you see it from a new perspective and you go, oh, wow, I didn't notice that before. That whole point he made about, well, now you've basically given up nature to the humanists is also sort of an aha moment for me. Because then I started seeing the neo-Thomistic and neo-scholastic view as problematic because I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. Like, we're trying to limit our understanding of nature to what we can know through natural reason. But that's not the full truth. And so I started understanding that, oh, he's right. This does sort of lead to, to humanism and away from the importance of grace in, in nature and also away from the fathers, which was part of his point. He was saying, look, go back to the fathers. To them, Christianity was the true philosophy. And Rathjen right, argues right, this right. too in his book, Nature and Mission of Theology. There was a distinction, but they weren't separated. It wasn't until later and even after Aquinas that you got this radical separation between philosophy and theology that you get in the neo-scholastic schools. And that's why it's neo-scholasticism and not just scholasticism. And here's another important aspect of that. Notice a terni patris. I always find this interesting because it's the one where a lot of traditionalists will cite, we'll see Aquinas is the one we need to go to. That's fine. I love Aquinas. He's one of my favorite theologians. But notice that the title of the document itself is actually on the restoration of Christian philosophy. It doesn't even say theology. It's Christian philosophy. And using Aquinas as the one to, to renew Christian philosophy. Now, why is that important? Because according to some Thomists, Christian philosophy is oxymoronic. Because in their view, the radical separation between revelation and reason is such that philosophy cannot use revelation. As soon as it does, it's no longer philosophy, it's theology. So the very title of the work, you know, what it's about is the restoration of Christian philosophy implies that you can have revelation purify philosophy and remain philosophy. That again, grace does not destroy nature. Revelation does not destroy reason. Theology doesn't destroy philosophy. It perfects it but it's still philosophy. Hmm. It's still nature. Right. You know, when we get divinized through grace, our nature has not been destroyed. By having a supernatural end, our nature is perfected. It's the, you know, it it raises it up. But that's why our nature exists. In some sense, human nature exists to be lifted up and given a share in divine life, right? And we know this from scripture as well. I mean, made in the image and likeness from the beginning right? From the very beginning, God offered grace and Adam and Eve enjoyed it. So that, that is the creation of man. That's the real story. And 
we have to allow that truth into Lou Bach's view to affect how we understand human nature. You can't understand human nature apart from the truth for why we were created and the goal of our creation. Again, going back to philosophy, right? You have Aristotelian philosophy. You have the different causes, right? Well, one of the aspects of the nature of a thing is its final cause, its reason for existence. That's what it tends towards. And if that's why God created us, that's our final end. And that says something about our nature. That's actually, in some sense, what makes our nature special. Now that you've explained DeLubach's view and the concerns mm -hmm. he was responding to, can you just maybe put that side by side with what would be the kind of the popular animus? Like it's somebody mm -hmm. who on Twitter who says DeLubach is, you know, the demonic il infiltrator of the church who's caused all of the problems in theology, what would they say his position on nature and grace is? They'd probably say that he's naturalized the supernatural. He's made it a part of nature itself and something attainable. I mean, the one Peter five article that was referenced in the video that I responded to that started all this, that was a terrible misrepresentation of, of the Lubach, but basically asserted that he said, we already have by nature, the ability to attain the beatific vision without being incorporated into the sacramental life of the church or something to that effect. As if the sacraments in the church were unnecessary for or unimportant. And that mm. certainly was not to Lubach's position, especially if you understand his Eucharistic ecclesiology. I mean, for him, the church is everything. He wrote another book called The Motherhood of the Church. Like he's very much a man of the church and was against secularism. Let's remember that. I mean, he was fighting atheistic humanism. So no, he doesn't want to say we can attain our final end without grace. And it's not like grace is already possessed by nature. Kind of the opposite of what he said. That's kind of yeah. the, what he was fighting against. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't, he wasn't saying that at all. So, you know, I think what, now there are some other more intelligent theologian philosophers that also kind of disagreed with him, but they sort like of- Like Feingold. Like Feingold, even some other known Thomists who have made the comment that they basically blamed the Lubach for destabilizing the unity of Catholic theology. So they look at his influence upon the likes of John Paul II and Ratzinger as leading to basically he, in some sense, the Lubach succeeded in his goal and people basically started accepting his positions and going back to reading Thomas himself and not just Cajetan and Suarez or the manuals that purported to be Thomistic. They started going back and reading the church fathers and developing patristic theology or developing their theologies from patristic sources, and therefore, in some sense, broke free of the strict confines of this is Catholic theology and only this is. And so from their perspective, that was bad because no longer could you just say Catholic theology is monolithic. It is X, Y, and Z and nothing else. He sort of reintroduced, in a certain sense, the breadth of the tradition. And now people could feel free to, for instance, study Bonaventure, <laughs> who's also the seraphic doctor, you know, one of the doctors of the church, and might actually prefer, it's okay to prefer Bonaventure on something rather than Aquinas, for instance. So in some sense, they lost their monopoly on Catholic theology. And they see it as a breaking of the unity of Catholic theology. Whereas mm -hmm. de Lubach would say, no, it's just, it's the unity and harmony. Like yeah. being in favor of Bonaventure or Augustine is not to be anti-Thomas. And that's where I think, right. you know, people think, oh, he's against Thomas. Well, he's not. I mean, de Lubach, I would say primarily is a Thomist in many ways. I would hope that there's a way to incorporate all these things, not even not just be anti-Thomas, but even to not be against having Thomism be kind of the preferred umbrella within which we incorporate these other insights. I mean, yeah. because that is seems to be the position of the popes anyway, you know, that this yeah. is the the privileged way of teaching theology at the very least. So so one would hope mm -hmm. that, you know, the thought of St. Thomas can actually you know, incorporate all these other things in some way. Yeah. You know, and again, this is, I think, a point Ratzinger makes, you know, he goes, well, I'm not particularly, he's not particularly a Thomist in a strict sense, but he's not against Aquinas. 
He just didn't like some people that pre- the way they presented him. And he doesn't, you know, it's so there's a difference between just not sort of being one who does nothing but comment on Aquinas and being anti Thomist. They weren't. The Communio School is not against Aquinas. And de Lubach, I mean, if you look at, again, his, his works on nature and grace specifically, he's basically saying, no, this is the authentic Aquinas. This is authentic Thomism. And that's why he, he argued that his theology wasn't the new theology. Theirs was. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, certainly I think, you know, I did another video on the, the role of Aquinas in Catholic theology. And I think especially in Catholic dogmatic and systematic theology, you know, there are some places that don't give him enough, and there's some places that only do Aquinas. I do think the greater danger is to not do enough Aquinas. Because as, as one of my friends once stated, he sticks with Aquinas just because he knows it's safe. I don't have a problem with that. I have no problem with someone being a Thomas scholar and just wanting to focus on Thomas's theology. I really don't. I just think we, you know, we have to, if we're going to follow the example of how Thomas did theology though, because if you read Eterni Patris, that's what it says. It, it, it actually explicitly says we don't necessarily have to follow Thomas on every point, especially if certain things come to light that make us realize, well, on that point, he, he was wrong. We don't have to just take it. I mean, it explicitly states this. It basically says he, we follow Aquinas, his example of how he did Christian philosophy, because he was so good at it. And one of the things he was so good at was reading the breadth of the tradition. Aquinas went back to the fathers and went back to the scriptures repeatedly. He's citing sources in the East and West. And in his commentaries on scripture, he's doing the same thing. He's citing the fathers. He cites Augustine more than anyone else. So in many ways, he is an Augustinian. So Aquinas, was that's what he was doing. He wasn't just reading one person, repeating it. He was reading the Cappadocian fathers and, you know, Dennis the, the Areopagus or Pseudo Dionysius is reading Augustine and all the different scriptures. I mean, and, and trying to synthesize them, which is why he became so great. And so in some ways, de Lubach saying, yeah, that's what we need to be doing, too. I think the desire to be safe in the tradition in a certain sense of the word safe is a good thing. There's a mm-hmm. reason that the word novelty has been a pejorative for yes. most of the church's history. You know, mm-hmm. we're not free thinkers in Catholic theology. We are little baby birds, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> waiting for something to be dropped down our gullet. Right. I you agree know? with that. <laughs> and so so do I think the Lubach would say, you know, based on what I've read of him, the Lubach would say that though that you don't do speculative theology or explore new paths just for the fun of it and you know for the intellectual thrill you do it in part ultimately to grow in love right? right but in part you do it because the old ways of expressing things you know they have to be revitalized to remain themselves and to remain safe that's mm-hmm. a big point that he makes repeatedly in the one book that i've read by him is is and this is something you know i think I feel like Chesterton said things along these lines as well, is that things have to be continually sort of renewed and refreshed to remain themselves. It's not that it's not that the actual dogmas of the church or the doctrines of the church become old and need to be updated, but that our ways of talking about them in theology, which is a different thing. And you just did a video on this, the difference Mm -hmm. between doctrine and theology, because they're not the same thing, you know, our humans, our systems of Mm -hmm. speaking about them do need to be, you know, we do need sort of air holes opened up to revitalize them from time to time so that they don't decay into something else. Yes, absolutely. I think that's really accurate. And that's, I think, a lot of what the Communio School was trying to do, because there was a real danger that the Catholic faith was becoming less and less important. And in some sense, I mean, they were worried about secularization primarily because they were worried that it was getting too locked in on itself. It wasn't addressing people's questions that were relevant to them today. And it was just sort of leaving all that aside. And so a big part of what they wanted to do was re-express the perennial truths of the faith. I mean, they they do hold the perennial truths, just like the Neo-Thomas and Neo-Scholastics. There are real perennial truths. 
again, on the side that I'm arguing for. Now, the more liberal side, yeah, they were more willing to throw all that stuff out, but not the communal school. They're more on the side of the traditionalists, which is why liberals think that they're traditionalists, because they were more on the, the conservative side of it to preserve and conserve the tradition. But they wanted to be able to express it anew and to also grasp with it because they had a love for it. It was like, like you were saying, it's the lover wants to know more about the beloved. And so really wants to engage with the questions and think about it and ruminate and express it, not just sort of repeat back. And yeah, it's important for it to stay alive that that needs to be done. Going back to the work you're doing in the context of kind of today's traditionalist subculture, I really appreciate not just the evident, you know, good faith in which you make your videos, but also there's a sobriety to your approach. You're not using a lot of kind of flashy colors and trying to tickle people's ears. And I do feel like, you know, as much as, you know, some people want to have their ears tickled with, with new doctrines and other teachings, you know, there's also people who want their ears tickled with kind of a drama and Mm -hmm. apocalyptic controversy and things like that. So I think that's a real issue in in the traditionalist movement is this kind of flashy colors approach as opposed to just kind of a sober and nuanced and not sort of immediately punchy approach to seeking the truth. Right. Drama sells, right? I mean, that's the the reality. And and sometimes, unfortunately, people like to be angry. They like to have an enemy to constantly bash. And I really love the way that you just phrased all this because it it sort of reminds me of of my own internal thought processes and deciding to do a lot of these videos. It's something I've dealt with my entire life. I have been a devout Catholic since before my memories even start. And the way I know that is from other people telling me stories about when I was young that I don't remember. So being Orthodox and being Catholic have been important to me since the time I was an infant, you know, infant baptism. Yay. So as I grew and developed and encountered more and more people, this became a difficult question for me because I really can't stand liberals and it drives me nuts. Like people that are willing to throw out dogmas. I mean, I I went to my own college's president and the chancellor of the college and said that one of their, you know, some of the things being said by people in the ministry office and and things were wrong and needed to stop. <laughs> you know, I was very much against heresy and at the same time, I started noticing other people that were on the other side of it that were going way off and were actually breaking away from Holy Mother Church and making all sorts of claims about things that were just disturbing. And there was this vitriol and venom there that just really bothered me because I always loved the church. So it was kind of strange to see people defending the church by hating her. And it, it just bothered me. And I've thought about it a lot because obviously – Theologically, I would agree much more with the neo-scholastics than I would the aggiornamento folks in the on that side of the Nouvelle Theologie. So why do I spend a lot of time speaking to the neo-Thomists and trying to correct their thought? Because I'm closer to them. It's sort of like I get more upset by people that I should have more agreement with than I do. <laughs> like people in your own party, mm-hmm. you want to keep in line more. Sort of like the the role of the whip in like British parliamentary structure, either the majority whip or the minority whip, their job is to kind of keep people in the party in line and to try to get them to be unified. And I think that's part of why I get so upset when I see traditionalists get things wrong with regards to these fellows, because they're not, I don't see the two groups as enemies. I think that they should be working towards the same goal in a certain sense, the division between like the communio school and the traditionalist school has meant that they're focusing on each other instead of on the actual common enemy. And I think it's important to show how they, they can unite again. You know, it's the same in politics. People that are, you know, I'm more closely associated with the politics, I expect higher standards of. Like there's things I don't expect from liberals that, or things I expect to see from liberals that I don't expect to see from conservatives. And if a conservative starts talking, you know, being deceitful or being fallacious in argumentation or being 
detracting or saying something false, it bothers me more when it's someone from my own party because I expect more. You're part of my family. You're part of my group. Let's get our act together. You know, we need to be the ones that are virtuous and being just and accurate in what we say. We can't fall into the popularism of just saying whatever gets the headlines. You know, that's in right. using just rhetoric. So I, I think that's why I think it's just important yeah. for people who want to be faithful to, to be a little bit more accurate. And, and that's sort of the role I try to play in all of this. So I, I think you expressed that well. Well, uh, Richard, it's been a real pleasure talking yeah. to you, and I really appreciate the work you're doing. I hope people will go check it out. I will link to do. the DeClue's Views YouTube channel at the show notes for this page, and I'll also link to a past episode I did with a translator of a recent new translation of a, of a book by Gargu Lagrange, which deals with some of these issues mm-hmm. from his perspective. So if people want to get a taste of kind of the neo-scholastic approach, they can do that as well because yeah, it certainly absolutely. has you know, things to recommend it as well. So yeah, thanks so much, Richard. Yeah. And just as a, another additional plug, I also have a blog called Sapientia Nulliformis, which is on the Wix site. So uh, some of the things that I do on my channel, YouTube channel, I've also written about, but they are somewhat distinct. So you know, feel free to check that out as well. Yeah, well, I'll definitely, yeah, I'll link to that for sure. Great. Thank you for having me on. 